thank you everyone for participating in this webinar the topic for the webinar is lung cancer management this initiative is brought to you by integrated academic society of clinical oncology american college of digital healthcare south asian journal of cancer astrazeneca intas oncology and kavina creation i will go through the basic etiquette for the meeting we have muted all the participants till the end of the speaker session and for this reason we request you not to mute your device yourself if you have any questions please make use of the chat feature and send the same to sofia anthony raj once the presentation is done you will be able to ask your question i will unmute you and you will also be visible on the screen when you talk please note that you have the option of joining with video or without video please be conscious of your attire orientation and your display picture please also be aware of your surroundings now i would like to hand over to our first speaker for the evening dr central rajappa over to you sir thanks kashish and uh, good evening to everybody who has uh, tuned in this evening uh, so the topic given to me is what is the ideal treatment strategy for egfr mutant non small cell lung cancer and that's not an easy question to answer but what i will try and do in the next 15 minutes is to see analyze a little bit of this data to put some sense into it and then i will end with my opinion on what we should be doing for patients with egfr mutant non small cell lung cancer this is the most recently published pan asian adapted guideline uh, the options for anybody who's got an egfr mutant lung cancer is listed up there you have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 options that's something like this next slide please now if you are the medical oncologist and you're going through these options those options are getting longer and heavier and let's try to dissect through some of this data in the next 10 to 15 minutes next slide kashish right so what i will do is not go into the nitty gritty of each of these studies i thought i will start by taking studies which have shown overall survival benefit only today so there are three trials or strategies that have shown overall survival benefit one is the archer 1050 the second is the flora study and the third is the chemotherapy plus tki strategy all of these have shown overall survival benefits in egfr mutant lung cancer next slide this is the most famous of them all at least on paper supposed to be the best now this is flora where patients were randomized to osimertinib with either gefitinib or erlotinib in the test the standard arm the hazard ratio was 0.80 not so great if you look at the confidence interval the upper limit of confidence interval is nearly touching one there and the p value has just scraped into into the confidence levels but having said all that if you look at the curves they start separating very early at the end of 36 months you've got more than 50% of patients in the osimertinib arm still alive compared to about 10% less in the gefitinib arm so this is the most important data that one has to know as far as single agent studies for egfr mutant lung cancer is concerned next slide start kashish right so we always get into this subset analysis and then say patients who were asians did not benefit nobody has really been able to explain why asian patients don't really benefit and then when you come down you see that the deletion 19 patients seem to be benefiting while the 858r don't seem to be benefiting we still really don't know the reasons for this differential benefit nobody has been able to explain this properly so far next slide please So if the data is not so robust though there is an overall survival benefit of about 6 months why is it that then all of us are so taken up with osimertinib and you ask anybody which is the best choice they will immediately blurt out saying that the choice is osimertinib so these are the reasons and i think it's very evident from what happened to patients post the trial now if you look at in general kashish next slide if you look at these in general you see that only around 40 to 50% of patients actually get on to the next line therapy at all so nearly half of all patients stop with first line therapy now again if you ask anybody who practices lung cancer medicine they will tell you that you have to test for t790m 
and 50% of patients are positive for T790M and all of them have to get onto osimertinib. Now look at what actually happens in the study. If you started with 100 patients, when you expect 50 to get onto osimertinib, only 30 get onto osimertinib. So not all patients get on to the optimal second line therapy as you would like them to. Now, the other important issue that one needs to keep in mind is that you can't really predict at the time of diagnosis as to who will have T790M mutation at the time of progression. Because if you have a T790M, then the option is obvious. You have to get on to osimertinib. That's ideal. If you don't have it, then your outcome is not going to be as optimal as somebody who got onto optimal. And if you look at what happened on the study, you say that nearly a third of patients who went on to second line therapies actually got onto a second line TKI, which is not awesome. Typically, not something that would lead to an overall survival or a progression free survival benefit. But then for all of you, that is real world practice also. We try to juggle around with all the drugs that we have. The two other most important reasons why people use osimertinib, CNS efficacy is absolutely super compared to all the other options that we have. And so is the case with tolerance compared to all the other options that we have. So this is one slide that tells you the most important reasons as to why osimertinib seems to be the best choice for most of our patients who are diagnosed with an EGFR mutation positive lung cancer. Next slide, please. This is the other famous, very debated issue. What about the combination of chemotherapy plus a first generation TKI? And in all studies, jefferitinib has been the TKI of choice in that setting. Now, what's good about this data? The data is very robust. I showed you a hazard ratio of 0.8. Look at the hazard ratios on your slide. It's 0 0.50, that's very consistent. It's also reproducible, which is very, very important because what works in Japan should work in Korea, should also work in India. And that's what is typically shown on this slide. The hazard ratio in all of these studies are around 0.5. But if you look at the absolute benefit in terms of overall survival, that kind of varies. In the Tata Hospital study, the overall survival has not been reported or not reached yet. While if you look at what happened in the Japanese study, it's about 52 months, a whopping 52 months. None of these studies so far have shown such a lovely survival benefit for EGFR mutant patients. Now, whether the Japanese are different, the answer is yes. It's so difficult to kill a Japanese, even if he's got lung cancer, whether he's got stomach cancer, I'll very show you some data to, to really substantiate that. Look at the percentage of patients who actually got onto a second line therapy, 90% of all patients. That's not something you expect all over the world. The Tata hospital was not really far away. 75% got into second line. Now, the other important thing to notice from these data is that, again, going back to the 30% who went on to second line osimertinib in the FLORA study, you see that only about 20% in the Japanese study 11% in the Indian study actually got osimertinib in the second line. So second line therapies are there, but not everybody gets to second line. Not everybody has the most optimal second line therapy that they should actually be getting. This is to be kept in mind before you make your choice of first line therapy also. Next slide, please. Now, this is the most recent data that was updated at the ESMO Asia last year. This is Archer 1050. This is a second generation TKI, which is dacometinib. No patients with central nervous system metastasis went into this. The randomization was DACO versus jefferitinib. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival. There was a hierarchy analysis that was done. Next slide, please. This is the overall survival data. The one on your left is the Kaplan-Meier projection of overall survival in 2017 publication. The overall survival was positive. It favored dacometinib compared to jefferitinib. 34 months versus 26 months compared to 38 months and 31 and a half months that you got in the FLORA study. So the absolute benefits are better for osimertinib compared to dacometinib. You see that the curves are actually getting crossing over to each other in the 2017 publication. 
But the updated data that was shown at the ESMO Asia last year clearly showed that there was nice separation. What are the important things that you have to notice here? I showed you the osimertinib data where there was lovely separation starting from day one. But if you look at what happens with DECO, you see that to begin with, the jefferitinib curve is actually better. Again, something that nobody has been clearly able to explain. We think that the adverse event profile of osimertinib was bad. And to begin with, quite a few patients dropped off this curve. But everybody, including the first author, Tody Mock, has not been able to clearly tell us why this is actually happening. But if you look at the hazard ratio, the hazard ratio is marginally better. The confidence intervals are better. And the p-value is also better compared to what you got on the floral. So there are some problems as far as this analysis is concerned, but that is the data for you. Again, look at what happens when patients go on to the second line. The PFS was 14.7 versus 9.9. 48% on the DECO and 60% on the jefferitinib arm had second line therapy. And only 10% again have osimertinib. Again, I want to reiterate the importance of this particular data. Next slide, Kashish. Now, this is the forest plot. Again, I want you to compare this forest plot to what you saw in the flora. Here, Asian and non-Asian patients seem to be benefiting. Interestingly, exon 19 deletions don't seem to be benefiting as much as what you saw on the flora, but L858R seem to be benefiting but what I want you to always see is the interaction P that is on the right side of the slide. That interaction P is not significant, which tells us that one should not read too much into this subset analysis because that P is not significant there. Next slide, please. Now, I wanted to do a little bit of arithmetic for physicians just to tell you what would actually happen if you started with a second generation TKI and wanted to follow a sequential strategy. Now, this is the Aura 3 study, the Aura 3 randomized patients with T790M. Now, these were patients who had progressed after a first generation TKI and they had a T790M mutation. They were randomized to osimertinib versus chemotherapy. Look at what happens here there's no survival benefit. And the reason why there is no survival benefit for osimertinib is because 73% of patients on chemotherapy actually crossed over to the osimertinib arm. Now, they did some mathematical statistical analysis and they did some crossover adjustment and came up with this Kaplan-Meier curve, which shows that if you didn't get to the crossover, this is what your survival would have been. You would have benefited with osimertinib 26.8 months. If you took only chemotherapy, your survival would have been around 16 months, so a 10-month difference in overall survival. Now, let's do that small calculation. If you took a second-generation TKI, your PFS is 14 months with dacometinib. That's what I've taken as the prototype here. Remember, that is data for patients who don't have CNS metastasis. Now, if your first PFS is 14 months, and then you had a T790M, you add 26 months to that, you would get to somewhere around 41 months. But what I want you to notice even more importantly is that if you didn't have a T790M, then you would get 14 months plus 16 months, which is what you get if you went on to chemotherapy. And that's grossly lesser than what you get as the 38 months survival in the flora data, right? So, when I try to tell you that you cannot predict who's going to get T790M at progression, this is what I was trying to explain, that if you got a T790M positive, you got onto osimertinib, your survival is great. But if you didn't get that, then your survival is not so great. And that's why many people feel that get onto osimertinib straight away, and then you don't have to worry about who's going to get in here and there. Next slide, Kashish. Right, we, towards the end, we come on to these uncommon mutations with greater application of NGS in our patients. We are now seeing that we are finding out more patients with uncommon mutations. That's roughly around 8 to 10%. Now, when it comes to uncommon mutations, the drug that takes the cake is afatinib because that is what has greatest data in this group of patients. 
you see the comparison between afatinib versus the first generation afatinib trumps the first generation TKI in terms of response rates. Next slide, please. Now, there's recent data in uncommon mutations with osimertinib also. You see that this small data with 36 patients again clearly shows that osimertinib also works in this group of patients. The overall response rate is around 50%, which is not very different from what you get with afatinib and uncommon mutations. Next slide, please. Quality of life is extremely important. I don't have time to go through this slide in detail. We're running out of time. But what is important is that as far as quality of life is concerned, adverse event is concerned, nothing is as good as osimertinib. Everybody who has used this drug will really agree with me that this is the best drug to use as far as uh, quality of life is concerned. Next slide, please. So we come to where we started. That's my last slide. Kashish, can you keep moving fast? Yes, great. So uh, this is my opinion. If you have somebody with central nervous system metastasis, a frail elderly or somebody with T790M at the time of diagnosis, that is two to 3% of all patients, there's absolutely no doubt that osimertinib should be the drug of choice. But if you had somebody who is young and fit, you could still use a sequencing strategy, either decomitinib or chemotherapy plus jefitinib, or you could still use osimertinib in this group of patients. If you had uncommon mutations, afatinib or osimertinib would be your drug of choice. For all the others who don't fit into any one of these categories, please don't forget that we have the good old warriors, jefitinib and erlotinib. Of course, if your patient can afford afatinib, that's also a great drug to use. Kashish, next slide. But ultimately, at the end of the day, this is what is important. You have to sit, use your brain a little bit, put that data into perspective, talk to your patient, and then finally say that this is the best choice for you. With that, I will stop and hand it over back to the organizers. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you very much, Santil. That was absolutely amazing. And to the point, um, uh, please continue to be with us because there will be a lot of questions towards the end. And I hand over back to Kashish for the next part. Kashish, I think we can't hear you. Sorry, I was uh, muted. Uh, our next speaker for the evening is uh, Dr. Srinivas. So, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, thank yeah. you. So, please go ahead, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone, and pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I would be speaking on radiation therapy for brain metastasis from non small cell lung cancer, and a little bit of perspective on lung cancer management during the COVID as well. The general philosophy to give you a snapshot uh, during the pandemic is to avoid uh, radiation if possible in avoidable situations. If you cannot avoid, you limit the number of uh, radiation, uh, uh, the num limit the radiation dose and the exposure the patient would have to the hospital. Uh, so you either give single fraction or hypofractionate. If you cannot really limit or even if you can limit, you must protect the patient. Whatever is needed to be done, you need to be done. You need to get it done. If uh, even despite the protection, the patient uh, uh, has some symptoms, you have to be alert to, to investigate it uh, and have a lower threshold to investigate and make sure that the patient is taken care of as well as the other patient get it, don't get infected. And if unfortunately the patient does get infected, you need to individualize the treatment strategies. Uh, the, the restriction of services is also varied, so you cannot indiscriminately escalate or de-escalate the treatment based on this. Uh, there could be no restriction. Um, I, think, I think in India, majority of the places, I, I think there are some exceptions, but there are no to minimal restriction of services. And the general rule, the time, distance, and shielding are the key factors. Next slide, please. Coming to how to manage brain metastasis in non-small cell lung cancer patient, you need to ask a few specific questions. I mean, you will obviously go through how many number of metastases you, you, are, you are seeing on an MRI, um, where are the location, what's the volume, um, and what are the symptoms. But typically at the time of diagnosis, you need to see 
key four key things. How symptomatic is the patient? Is it an emergency uh, or it, can it wait the management? Where is the CNS metastasis? I think it is extremely crucial. I tell you why it is crucial for especially as radiation oncologists as well as others, why the location is extremely critical. Is it in the brainstem or is it in thalamus or in posterior fossa? A little bit of edema in posterior fossa could produce symptoms. So this uh, location also is extremely important. Can systemic therapy be offered to delay intracranial treatment? This is irrespective of you, whether you are in COVID situation or not, because we know there are toxicities associated with intracranial treatment. And we need to ask ourselves, can systemic therapy be offered to delay intracranial treatment? The number four, if the intracranial treatment has to be delivered, is it amenable to SRS or a fractionated radiosurgery? I would tell you in next one or two slides, uh, which, which patients are suitable uh, for uh, this uh, stereotactic uh, based treatments, either single or limited number of fractions, or does the patient require whole brain RT? At the time of recurrence, all these four questions again pop up again, but do I have any active systemic therapy still to offer? What is the status of systemic disease burden at the progression? This is also extremely important. The next slide, please. Uh, regarding the sequence of radiation and systemic therapy, uh, there is a very little uh, good quality evidence. I don't want to bombard you with a lot of evidence, but I can tell you that there is no uh, high quality evidence as far as the sequencing is concerned, whether we do TKI first or intracranial treatment first for uh, oncogene-driven oncogene non-small cell lung cancers with brain metastasis, or we give a combined treatment. At least the retrospective data shows that upfront intracranial treatment is better than upfront TKI. I would uh, give you some evidence on that in the next one or two slides. But primarily, those studies were done in an era where the latest generation TKIs were not available, and hence there could be a lot of bias also associated with retrospective studies. Also to, to, to tell you why location is paramount is the, the partial response rate at least for radiation is near 100%. But whatever drug you use, osimertinib, electinib, uh, highest CNS penetration drug, the, the PR rate, the partial response rate is near 80%. The CR rate is between 20 to 40%. So there, is, uh, there are multiple uh, patients, group of patients who would not respond to these therapies and location would be paramount because if they progress, that would lead to significant deterioration of the neurological function or the quality of life. Next slide, please. Uh, in patients without oncogene-driven and non-small cell lung cancer with brain metastasis, I think offering intracranial treatment is relatively straightforward because we know that chemo penetration could be uh, varying between uh, different series and it's, we are not extremely sure how much uh, of CNS penetration is, of course, there are some exceptions. I would come to that, but offering intracranial treatment is relatively straightforward in oncogene, non-oncogene driven, non-small cell lung cancer with brain metastasis. In uh, patients who receive intracranial treatment, typically as, as a radiation oncologist, what we would see is what is the total tumor volume? If the tumor volume is between eight to 10 cc or less than that, we would give single fraction stereotactic radiosurgery between 18 to 24 grade, depending on the, the volume and, and, and uh, the size that, that means, as well as the location. If this lesion is a bit too large for our comfort for a single fraction, we would consider three to five sittings of radiation. Typically, I would uh, prefer a three fraction schedule, especially during this pandemic period, if GTV is more than 10 cc. If there are multiple metastases, multiple location, uh, typically, we would offer either a hippocampal avoidance, whole brain RT, or if there are extremely uh, num multiple number of uh, metastases, including near the hypothalamic region uh, and hippocampal region, uh, probably whole brain RT itself with uh, a SIB, that is simultaneous integrated boost, if there are extensive metastases seen. Next slide, please. So I thought I will divide the clinical situations uh, to simplify the matters into patients who are symptomatic with extensive METs with poor performance score or symptomatic brain METs patient with limited uh, metastasis or even asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic who could have met metastasis in critical location, who could, have who could have limited metastasis or who could have extensive miliary type METs but the patient is relatively asymptomatic or patients who have leptomeningeal spread. So all these seven clinical situations 
I would tell you what would be the best. Next slide, please. So a patient who is highly symptomatic with one to three metastases, like this uh, gentleman who uh, had a pineal region met, who had presented with hydrocephalus, surgery would be the quickest uh, way to relieve his symptoms. And surgery is, is what is recommended, followed by a cavity or a post-op cavity SRS, which is a, a recommendation based on a randomized control trial. SRS uh, uh, without uh, 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 Radiation was uh, SRS uh, was offered after surgery, and it showed a significant improvement in intracranial control and progression-free survival. And hence, cavity SRS is the standard of care. So surgery followed by cavity SRS would be an ideal situation in this particular setting. This could be a patient who had an upfront uh, metastasis, or it could have been a, a recurrent situation where there could be uh, the, the systemic disease is limited or stable with a performance status allowing aggressive measures. In these settings, definitely a patient should be considered for surgery followed by SRS. Next slide, please. If a patient has, is not so symptomatic or with minimal symptoms with one or more locations in a critical location, for example, this patient has a metastasis in brainstem. So there are two metastases. The volume is actually very small and it could be amenable to even, even just uh, a systemic therapy you know, without giving uh, a radio, uh, radio surgery. But since this patient has uh, brain metastasis in critical locations such as brainstem, it is advisable to treat such patients. If you want to avoid treating other locations, you would at least treat the location uh, which is the, the, it, it would try, like to treat the uh, metastasis which is in the critical location also valid in patients with more lesions but one of them being in this particular location next slide please if you have a clinical situation where the patient is asymptomatic but has extensive miliary type we know in egfr uh, mutated patients this is a typical a typical uh, uh, pattern l 8 r and exon 21 you typically see this pattern TKI, if feasible, followed by close surveillance of CNS disease is what is preferred in, in majority of the situations. And then you offer hippocampal avoidance, whole brain RT, if feasible as salvage. Of course, this is one option. The other option is that you would directly go for intracranial treatment. Uh, in the absence of oncogene driven mutation, in such situation, intracranial treatment at least is preferable, especially during this COVID uh, situation because it is least invasive. It is least immunosuppressive. You could use a hypofractionated schedule of four to five sittings of radiation where you could delay chemotherapy. In fact, in a metastatic setting, uh, uh, it, there is no hurry to start uh, uh, treatment if the patient is not overtly symptomatic or doesn't have a visceral crisis uh, for extracranial disease. Next slide, please. If a patient uh, uh, is asymptomatic with limited CNS, but is not like a miliary pattern what we see, uh, we could... Uh, of, there is little, very, uh, very little gain in dealing SRS in such situation because you would give, be giving very localized treatments followed by TKI would be the easiest way to go forward. But having said that, these are precisely the patients who would actually be safely be observed because there are these are these patients have limited volume metastasis in non-critical location. They have a, a, a option of a, a effective systemic therapy. So a patient who would receive TKIs, uh, if the patient responds with at least a partial response, a close intracranial surveillance can be continued. If the patient progresses, or uh, I think this I've underlined because if the patient even has a stable disease, I would be tempted to treat such patients with intracranial treatment. Uh, if there is progression, of course, whole brain RT is the option. Is this the right option if a first generation TKI is being considered is a question which we need to ask. For example, if this patient is put on jeftinib, should we be, should he, is it safe to consider TKI alone and delay SRS because SRS would lead to minimal intracranial toxicity. Next slide, please. So there are two major studies just to summarize the entire uh, evidence on this. Uh, the first one is publication from the uh, JCO. It was published a few years ago. It was a retrospective study, but large and uh, very, well, uh, uh, very well analyzed. This clearly showed that upfront SRS, the patients had best outcomes compared to patients who received upfront EGFR TKI. Of course, these were not in the era of osimertinib. These were the first generation TKIs. Similarly, if 
there is, uh, this is a meta-analysis of multiple retrospective studies, this also showed that intracranial treatment is better in terms of response, as well as four months progression-free survival, as well as two year overall survival. And this probably shows that you could give intracranial treatment in a patient who would anyway not require whole brain RT. You would not anyway give a lot of toxicity by means of uh, radio surgery. Next slide, please. In the fifth situation where the patient is highly symptomatic with extensive disease, uh, there is of course a randomized trial called QUADS trial, which actually compared patients between whole brain RT versus best supportive care. Uh, mind you, I will have to warn that in this study, patients who received whole brain RT, the median survival was only 2.2 months. That means they were really poor prognostic subgroup. So in these kind of patients where the performance status is very poor, it is acceptable, especially in this situation, if the patient wants to avoid hospital visits, it is acceptable the patient is put on best supportive care, which includes steroids. So, but mind you, this is acceptable only in very poor prognostic subgroup. Next slide, please. In patients who have intracranial progression, uh, patients could have systemically controlled disease or stable disease. You would give intracranial treatment, which could be SRS or hippocampal avoidance, whole brain RT, followed by continuation of same systemic therapy. Or if the patient has both systemic as well as intracranial progression, uh, of course, the intracranial, intracranial treatment would be followed by a change in systemic therapy. The next slide, please. If the patient has leptomeningeal meds, it's a bit tricky because we know that leptomeningeal pets don't do, patients don't do well, but there are a category of patients who have high performance status, who have no major neurological deficits. You see often sometimes a, a patch of leptomeningeal enhancement, but the patient has an oncogene-driven uh, cancer. In such patients, in good risk patients, you could consider EGFR, TKIs, and you could delay the intracranial treatment in such patients as well. Next slide, please. So to conclude, uh, I think I have summarized all different clinical situations and my time is also up. We, I had published this small commentary on brain metastasis towards understanding the molecular milieu. Based on that, you need to take a, 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 take a decision. Most brain metastasis will be treated without a biopsy. So there could be, we know that there is a discordance between primary and metastasis with respect to molecular milieu. So we need a better understanding of that. There is a, a emerging a, a role for liquid biopsy from CSF, uh, which could actually lead us to a better understanding of the mutational burden and the evolution of the mutations uh, among patients with brain metastasis. With that, I will, I will conclude. Thank you very and much. Srinivas, that was a great job. Thank you very much. Even though time was exceeded, but it's still an important message for our colleagues. Now over to for the next speaker, please. Our next speaker for the evening is Dr. T.P. Sahu. Uh, over to you, sir. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, thanks, Dr. Purveshar, for giving this opportunity. So in the next 10 minutes, my job will be to talk about the prevention and management post-radiotherapy. That was a talk given to in brain metastasis in oncogenic driven NACLC. Okay, so so for introduction, I divided that I'll be speaking one or two slides will be an introduction, which will be fast enough. Then we go to EGFR mutations, then the ALK mutations, and the last part already Srinivas has covered it. But there'll be two slides are uh, can we really avoid RT in a particular subset? Not uh, more than not more than two slides. Next. So incidence of brain, uh, lung cancer with brain metastasis is increasing and uh, that's very, very important for us. And we have to remember that uh, brain is the sanctuary site because of the blood-brain barrier. If uh, there are no brain metastasis, actually there are no systemic th drugs to not, are not able to reach because of the blood-brain uh, barrier, the tight endothelium. And that is the main reason why there's a lot of concern. And the rates of brain metastasis, if you look at it, around 25% of lung cancers would have metastasis at presentation and as really gradually they go up to that data are there that approximately three fourths of patients in their whole lifespan would have a brain uh, lung uh, brain metastasis next slide please okay and the reasons are very uh, are very clearly told that the longer we live because of the better drugs the way that things are moving and median survival has moved on the OS median has gone up to approximately three to four years. So the number of years we live, the chances of having brain metastasis will be better. And that's one of the main thing. Next. 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 Yeah. So, so, so here, go back. Yeah. 
so so this is a very important thing so when you talk of brain medicine oncogenic dri driven thing we talk of two things first thing what we are talking of is the alt rearrangement rearrangement when that is there you have a significant number of patients the starts of with 30 70% of a patient the other significant group which will have brain metastasis oncogenic driven will be those with egfr actually few data tell us that these are the subset of patients which will have the maximum number chances to develop a brain mets next yeah so coming to egfr so if you look at it i have put forward all the possible data which you have on the cns disease you have the data with the first generation tkis then we have the data with the second generation especially with afatinib because dacomatinib the trial archer did not have patients uh, with cns at uh, presentation and the final is the osimertinib the in thing the aura and the flora this data will be discussed in brief next so uh, for looking at the uh, uh, first generation tkis we talk of gefitinib and elotinib and the data would be uh, there would be no prospective trial as of now and the few data that has come up will be that gefitinib and elotinib nothing to choose between them but it is well uh, known that elotinib has a better cns penetration than gefitinib and one of the reason also could be that the uh, the substrate the, the which throws away the cytochrome substrate which throws away the uh, pump which throws away the drugs away from the cns gefitinib is one of that so that also could lead to that the concentration of gefitinib in the brain is quite low but all said and done the data which comes out for a when i took out this is a comparison although the trial is retrospective this was 100 patients with a first generation tki versus chemotherapy and to put the thing short around a quarter of them had a disease of brain at presentation and the, and let's see how they do next a majority received elotinib if you look at it the graph a and the graph b the graph a for the all eligible patients and we are looking at the incidence of cns progression the dotted line is for chemotherapy and the bold line below is for tkis and this very clearly shows for cns progression for all eligible patients the addition of tki really helps in comparison to chemotherapy in events of cns progression now come to the point b when the, the, the these are patients without prior cns involvement means those whom you would be preventing the cns disease from appearing if you give a good systemic therapy and here also the tkis have done a better job than the chemotherapy next next slide please yeah and, and if you look at it no no go back and and look at the uh, yeah look at the last c is the graph and if you look at the patients with prior cns involvement you would find that in terms of survival uh, just i'm sorry yeah in terms of survival uh there is no much of a difference for the events if they have a prior cns this is for the first generation tkis go, go ahead the first in tki to start it out are largely retrospective data small numbers brain mets were actually a trial exclusion criteria and still isn't there in some of the patients uh, some of the trials the response rates have been variable from as low as 50% to as as 80 85% and this patients one is to remember most of them had prior radiotherapy and that is and radiotherapy does have a better overall response rates and disease control next now coming to the effect in it this was the lux lung 3 and 6 and 7 put together this is two graphs one on the top and one on the bottom and if we we'll, if you look at it the, the red line and the blue line and we are looking at the development or chances of uh, a, a, a risk analysis of progression effect in treatment patient for with a uh, for brain mets and if you look at it the upper one is for baseline brain mets and these patients with baseline brain mets they do much better with afatinib compared to uh, the, uh, the the arm which were did not have and these have our chemotherapy arm and the lower one was those without baseline brain metastasis and this was significantly different and superior for patients who went on to receive afatinib next and this is the important thing and uh, and the put and, and the arrow where it is put is a trial between afatinib and the gefitinib and this has nothing to choose about in a randomized trial whatever data we have the first generation second generation in terms of cns although we know that afatinib has a better penetration it did not reflect in the data and thus median cns pfs were nearly the same again a 0.2 month survival difference uh, pfs difference 
in terms of afatinib next the third generation osimertinib is the in thing and if you look at it it's because the cns penetration is maximum we have more concentration of osimertinib in the brain which sandil has referred to next the data from the flora for cns efficacy if you look at it with patients with known cns mets of patient on the right hand side without known cns mets and look at the hazards is nearly the same it's nearly 0.46 to 0.47 to 0.48 telling you that the benefit is there in, in spite of having a mets or without having the mets the pfs looks the same next this is important if you look at the green that is for standard egfr tki in the flora it was a first generation and if you look at the brown it was the osimertinib in patients with known cns at trial entry for progression at cns osimertinib did much better if you look at the other arm uh, other small graphs three were with osimertinib baseline who did not have who developed new cns disease and seven was with for the for the tki to tell you that osimertinib did a very good job because of its known factor it is well penetrated in the cns next so to to end up some of the tki osimertinib afatinib both demonstrated activity into to that extent even the fosgen tki have done a good job better than the chemotherapy with brain metastasis and even there is enough data to tell us that this delay the first event of brain progression in those patients who did not have baseline brain metastasis next now coming to the second most important that is alx and we have two trials to just discuss or three maybe alx and the j alx and the other one will be the ascent ascent 7 so to go, go go ahead yeah so coming to the uh, arm uh, with the crizotinib and alectinib alex trial and this really had one thing that yes around 20 to 40% of this disease uh, patients had baseline had brain mets next yeah and if you look at the graph the the red one is crizotinib and the and the low one is alectinib look at the one year uh, in cumulative incidence rate of cns and if you look at it, it's 40% versus less than 10% of alectinib so that proves that alectinib has a much better cns penetration much better cns control and the if the patients have a cns disease also alectinib takes care of it much better next next yeah so now the jalex next this again tells you there are two things i would it is a, this is a busy graphs but i want to put you on the bold black line and the dotted black lines and if you look at it it tells you that alectinib does much better than the um, crizotinib next in spite of having a cns disease as presentation or without next so in summary the data suggests that alp positive non small cell lung cancer alectinib has a protective effect on cns it prevents a progression of cns disease also it prevents the development of new cns disease in patients next i'll just take one minute more Uh, efficacy of alk inhibitors in a meta analysis again proves the same next and if you look at it again the forest plot looks the same thing that alk inhibitors and especially the, the alectinib does a very good job next next this is the ascent 7 i'll just take half a minute here next this was a four arm study the fifth arm i'm leaving because of the left meningeal disease if we look at it the arm a had prior radiotherapy with prior alk and all the alk was tizotinib if the arm b had no prior radiotherapy and prior alk was there the arm 3 had prior radiotherapy and no prior alk and the arm 4 had no prior radiotherapy or no alk before next just to cut things short the most important is the median disease controls were nearly the same but only the arm 3 which had lesser number of patients it was not reached or not evaluated next and the os data if you look at it it was a staggering with a brain mets it, the os data all of the patient had brain mets either measurable or unmeasurable was around 2 and 1/2 years next maybe 26 to 27 months next and the last slides uh, the cns resistance pattern if you look at it uh, the ros is one more thing which i did not touch because if you look at the cumulative effect of the cns disease over a period of time is not as good as the egfr mutated or the alk positive patients next you know go back yeah this is the important to so look at it why we should be treating with a better drug and if you look at it the look at the left hand side the 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 bold uh, dark is the patients cost with a drug like alectinib and the crizotinib is on the lighter block and that is because of inpatient 
just to tell you that alectomy might be costly on the per se as a drug but if you develop a cns disease your other expenditures goes up your survival deteriorates and it has the economic impact it has been found that choosing alectomy or a better effective drug is better and economically much better next so i'll just skip this just go on for asymptomatic i just wanted to tell you that data is very limited but whatever data we have if you have egfr alk inhibitor plus radiotherapy versus rt alone or egfr inhibitor plus radiotherapy versus egfr tk alone there is no difference in survival next next the last slide conclusion so in oncogenic driven nsclc tki not only has better systemic control but also has good cns control osimertinib is probably the best drug of choice among tkis in egfr mutation lung cancer for the subset requiring alkinibit alectinib appears the best choice rt2 brain at least in symptomatic patient improves local control last cost is very very important you have to choose it as per the patient's pocket drug interaction like like afatinib if you have liver toxicity or multi drug pharmacy because it does not go through the liver metabolism could be a good choice and performance status might be important factors that help in the decisions next so thank you thanks very much sau you had to run through a lot of data but i think this is very important because as you rightly pointed out cns metastasis will keep on increasing and we will find them in the majority of patients so how to look after them is really crucial now we move on to the next speaker uh, thank you so much sir uh, can i request uh, our next speaker for the evening is dr amit rautan uh, over to you sir good evening everyone uh, thank you parik sir for giving me this opportunity so my topic for today is management of leptomeningeal metastasis in non small cell lung cancer and next please i think this is the most dreaded complication of non small cell lung cancer in clinical practice this is something we always fear and worry about luckily for us the incidence is very low it is about 3 to 5% but we have seen historically the survival is very poor it's only about 3 to 4 months uh, in the last few years you're seeing the incidence is going up and we already heard why we are getting better and better treatments in various subgroup of patients and what's happening with that is we are getting better survival but the leptomeningeals are remaining as sanctuary sites and that's where the disease comes and that's why the incidence is going up also we have better neuroimaging tools and we are able to identify even small meningeal dissemination next please so there are two types of leptomeningeal metastasis one is when there is a diffuse type with there are free floating non adherent cancer cells in the csf and the other is a nodular type where you have contrast enhanced leptomeningeal nodules seen next please so diagnosis just a point i would want to stress here in clinical symptoms yes we sometimes see patients coming with cerebral symptoms cerebellar symptoms spinal cord compression of nerves cranial nerve palsies but please keep a very very watch close watch there are sometimes patients will come with very vague symptoms and you just don't know what's happening there's something wrong with them and you keep doing a scan you do a pet and you don't see anything major happening but they are deteriorating and clinically and neurologically they may be deteriorating keep a very high watch on these patients and look for leptomeningeal disease we end up doing a radiological imaging a contrast and mri is the best tool for us to show the enhanced meninges we end up doing a csf cytology which shows us at least in 50% the first time we do see the cytology positive if it's negative i we always say repeat the csf again you will pick up more in the next time and keep trying to do it again if required um if your if your suspicion is very high what has come up new is ngs testing on csf and if you see all the new trials they are actually looking at doing ngs on the csf picking up driver mutations and also picking up resistant mutations which are developing when patients are being treated with molecular targeted therapies next please so the management the goals of therapy are we want to improve and stabilize the neurological status we want to improve the quality of life and of course we want to prolong survival with limited toxicity and these goals and what we will use as modalities depend on what is the histology of the non small cell cancer what is the molecular profile what is the time of appearance of metastasis and what's the patient's performance status next please so this we just saw this diagram we are leptomeningeal group are stratified into two groups the good risk patients are those with which have a good performance status the neurological deficits are not very severe they have minimal systemic disease and the most important they should have a reasonable systemic treatment options available and 
if our patients have poor performance, they have severe neurological deficits, they have severe systemic diseases, they have bulky disease, they have encephalopathy, and if they don't have treatment options available, then probably these are patients who are going to do very, very poorly. Next, please. So a word on supportive care. Steroids form a backbone of treatment always. We start steroids, but please taper the steroids as soon as you can. We don't give anti-seizure medicines prophylactically. It's only used if you develop a seizure, then you, can, you can kind of recommend putting patients on anti-seizure medicines. And some of the patients who have symptomatic hydrocephalus, you may actually have to do a VP shunt to relieve the pressure. Next, please. Conventionally, this is the treatment modalities we always talked about. Intrathecal chemo, radiation, and systemic therapy. Next, please. Intrathecal therapy, this is from decades we have heard this. If, if, if we had a CNS, uh, if we had a leptomeningeal disease, please give IT methotrexate or please give triple IT. So, and still the drugs remain the same. It is intrathecal methotrexate, cytorabin or thiotipa. Steroids may not have too much of a role when we talk of intrathecal chemo. We use them only for non-nodular and non-bulky leptomeningeal metastasis. We should not be using them for, 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 for bulky leptomeningeal disease because it's not going to really help too much. And we have to combine them with systemic chemotherapy or systemic treatment, I would say. Next, please. Radiation, we already heard a lot about this. We know all the details. But in the present era, probably we would not do craniospinal radiation. We'd end up trying to do more and more stereotactic radiation. And we'll combine it with either intrathecal therapy or our systemic therapy. And now we are looking at more and more newer data sets where radiation is being combined with immunotherapy. We've seen data with pembrolizumab and our radiation combination because it is known to stimulate the immune response in the body, which can happen. Next, please. Systemic chemotherapy. This was what we were practicing for patients. If our patients were fit and we detected leptomeningeal, we gave them intrathecal therapy. We used some amount of radiation. And then if the patients were fit, we offered them platinum-based chemotherapy. Now, platinum combinations were used, platinum pemetrexate has been used, but we know the penetration of, of our chemotherapy drugs is really not very great into the leptomeninges. There is some data that adding bevacizumab will help. The, the data is not very strong, but then all these trials have a very small number of patients. Next, please. So, so moving on to the group of molecular-driven cancers, and we heard about EGFR-mutated lung uh, with brain metastasis, but EGFR-mutated non-small cell lung cancer, again, the incidence of leptomeningeal metastasis is much higher. We say 9 to 10 percent of patients may present with leptomeningeal metastasis in their lifetimes. First and second generation EGFR TKIs, we have seen they have a poor CNS penetration, so they are, they are not the best of drugs to be used, but if, if we compare you, erlotinib has a better penetration than gefitinib and efatinib. And a few years ago, we saw these data sets where we gave patients high dose erlotinib at pulsatile dosing. That was using 1,500 mg every week. So you're talking of almost 10 tablets of erlotinib of 150 mg given weekly. And it has been seen that it reaches the therapeutic level within the CNS, within, within the CSF. And there have been studies using this pulsatile erlotinib, where you give erlotinib every week. You can keep a small maintenance dose, but every week you give them these eight to 10 tablets of erlotinib. And survival in various studies, though these are small numbers, have ranged from 2.9 months to more than two years. Now, this is, a, this is one of the situations where even, even we were very skeptical initially, but we have clinical experience. I have a patient who's on pulsatile erlotinib for the last one year and doing wonderfully well. He, coming from a state of being bedridden to a state where he's walking around. And we just did pulsatile erlotinib for every week. We used to give him eight tablets and we used to keep a small erlotinib dose going on. There is another patient who's crossed eight months of treatment on pulse, pulsatile erlotinib. But the issue is you will going to have a lot of skin rashes. You're going to have problems. So be very careful when you give high dose erlotinib. Uh, there have been some data sets of using bevacizumab plus erlotinib. We've, we've seen, uh, which, which showed that it can reduce your radiological abnormalities. We know bevacizumab being an anti-VEGF can reduce the edema and combination with erlotinib has shown that it has, can control symptoms. But now we have moved to a generation of using the third generation drugs. We've heard the talks now previously where osimertinib we know has a very good CNS penetration. Next, please. So osimertinib was specifically looked at uh, uh, in, in one cohort of leptomeningeal metastasis, and this was the Bloom study. It was a phase one study, but there were 21 patients in this cohort who had an EGFR mutation. And 
who had leptomeningeal disease and they were treated with osomertinib, but here the dose was 160 mg every day. So you're talking of double dose. We use 80 mg every day, but here the dose was double, 160. And they were looking at overall survival. They're looking at um, radiological improvement and improvement in the CNS symptoms. Next, please. So to, out of the 21 patients, there were confirmed seven responses which happened and nine patients had stable disease. And also there were patients where the CSF cleared out. So clearly this drug is penetrating into the CSF and clearly it is helping patients with leptomeningeal metastasis. Next, please. And what this also showed was there were patients, seven of these patients have actually crossed 10 months by being on, only on osimertinib at 160 mg per day. So this is something we have recently picked up. I have one patient on osimertinib with leptomeningeal disease, and even she has crossed about eight, nine months now. Uh, again, when you see the flora data, you, 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 when, you, when you look at it, and you, you, there is really no requirement. There, there were subsets which looked at 160 mg in the brain, which said that even 80 in the brain is good enough. But I was kind of worried for my patient that I don't know whether we are doing adequate with 80. So we kept our patients on 160 mg per day. And we have seen some good response in leptomeningeal disease. Next, please. What about immunotherapy? This is probably the most exciting part of treatment in lung cancer these days. But we need to understand these drugs have very high molecular weight. They cannot penetrate the blood-brain barrier. But we know they can unblock the lymphocytes. And these lymphocytes can penetrate the blood-brain barrier. And that can give us response. So there was an Italian study which actually looked at nivolumab in 1,588 patients. This was all their their patient access program patients, and out of which 400 had brain metastasis. These are not leptomeningeal data, but they are brain metastasis. And uh, they showed a median of, um, uh, that the disease control rate was about 40% by using this immunotherapy. And now there are data sets looking specifically with immunotherapy in combinations uh, for patients with brain metastasis and also for leptomeningeal metastasis. Next, please. Yeah, so this is my last slide. Now. If you have a diagnosis of leptomeningeal metastasis, you, you see your patient's performance status. I spoke to you about the risk factors. The good risk patients, please look at the molecular uh, targets. If they have an EGFR mutation, the best therapy in the current era could be osimertinib. Uh, high dose osimertinib, probably I would say, but that would be wrong because there is data saying even 80 may be correct. But then these are patients where you're going to get one opportunity. So I think we can debate this point whether we're going to give 80 mg or 160 mg. I have used 160 with good results. Erlotinib, if your patients cannot afford osimertinib, I would say, please definitely give it a try. We were, we were wonderstruck with our responses of using pulse, pulsatile high-dose erlotinib, and we have patients even crossing a year. So I am very encouraged by high-dose erlotinib, but the skin toxicity can be bad. I have positive patients. We already heard this. There is, electinib is missing there. Electinib is the first drug of choice, but even brigatinib, lorlatinib have very good CNS penetrations. If a patient is EGFR and ALP negative, now there is the differences. If it's a non-nodular disease, please think of chemotherapy. You can combine intrathecal and systemic chemo. Bevacizumab may have a role to play. And I think this is a place where immunotherapy may have a place to play, role to play in future if the data sets come out good. In nodular disease, we would do the same, but we would also add radiation. Uh, I, I, this is the last slide. Thank you, everyone, for this. Thank you very much, Amit. Uh, leptomeningeal uh, disease for lung cancer is becoming a big challenge, even though in a small number of patients. And whatever you said is really going to help us, particularly the high-dose pulse uh, therapy that you have had immense experience with. Now, I think we move over to the panel discussion and over to Dr. Thir Raja, please. Thank you, Dr. Kash I mean, Dr. Parvish Bhai and uh, Kashis for inviting me. And uh, good evening to everyone. And uh, this panel discussion, uh, what I thought the way we will frame as discussed with Dr. Parvish is that we are going to present 10 to 12 um, situations or real cases and uh, which you may encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, I'm going to ask the panel uh, the questions as to how they will you know, encounter that. Imagine that I'm your um, second year registrar who just prepares the case and comes to you. And uh, these questions will be, you know, each case or situation will be presented to one or two of the panelists and I will request them to answer that. So we're just going to stick to clinical cases. And next slide. 
I'll begin with this patient. This patient is an um, age not told now, but this is a patient who has presented with a lung mass and was investigated for some sort of change in the sensor and then was seen to have hyponatremia and then went on to do scans and the scans picked up this lesion in the lung. It's about 3.4 centimeter into 2.5 or 6 centimeter mass in the left lower lobe and uh, the rest of the evaluation did not show anything else. Next slide. So that's the PET CT image of the lung mass, and the biopsy is confirmed as uh, the biopsy is confirmed as adenocarcinoma. I hope I hope that I am audible. Yes. And uh, thank you. So I will uh, go to you know Dr. Sanjay Sharma, sir. When you see this patient, what comes to your mind when you see a patient which has got a T2 lung lesion and apparently is more negative? That's what we thought at that point. This presented in 2016 and also all metastatic workup negative. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raja. I think this is a clearly a resectable lesion. Uh, but yes, uh, further workup, uh, when you said no metastatic disease, I would definitely like to do an MRI of the brain. Normal, uh, sir. MRI of the brain because usually about this size of region there is almost about two to five percent patient you may have a silent brain metastasis so we do that and uh, we definitely like to study the mediastinum uh, though in this single picture I can't make out with the nodes around in the mediastinum normal sir sorry both are normal MRI both are normal then uh, uh, I would uh, if the patient's COVID is negative at this moment of time. I would go ahead and uh, do surgery. And 2016, sir. He sorry? 2016 was the presenting date. Right, then I will go ahead and do a uh, uh, under back to me. Okay. Then Only one more information. Clear. 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 Yes. Only one more information. This sir. patient turns out to be age 99. Hmm. For, me, for me, age criteria, uh, age is a number. It ultimately depends on the physiological output, outcome of the patient. Obviously, all patients of ours, they go in for a cardiac evaluation in terms of stress dopamine and other uh, six minutes walk tests and other tests, which if they are all right, then only they are taken for surgery. Obviously, that, that, that I operated only the patient. That's very encouraging to hear, age 99. Thank you. I've operated patient of 98. So, one, one <laughs> less than one. <laughs> totally agreed. Totally agreed. Why not? I'll turn to Dr. Vijayananda Reddy, sir. I have summarized that this is a T2N0 M0 lung in a 99-year-old uh, in a in a reasonably you know good performance for that age. Geriatric scale, okay. Um, what will be your approach if the patient says that no, I don't want to go for surgery, Dr. Vijayan? Uh, without any bias, uh, I think uh, certainly hats off to Dr. Sharma, sir, uh, that he would offer operating on this patient, but and also should ask the patient whether he would be willing to go for uh, surgical resection. But nevertheless, uh, we uh, there are several uh, studies and data uh, which initially started with uh, people who are not fit for surgery to go for SBRT and the results are on par with the surgical resection. So especially in this age group, above the age of 65 to 70, when there is a borderline uh, a medical condition where the risk of surgery plus or minus would certainly opt radiation as the first option a radical radiation with uh, sbrt would be the preferred choice and yes. basically we have a, yeah have a dose, dose and fractionation would you want to say something about that how do you approach the radiation yeah the only uh, issue here would be a normally 18 to 20 grain to three fractions but in this patient we need to be careful about the constraints to be followed for the rib cage. Most of these patients, uh, in case if the rib dose goes up, they would have pain or rib fracture in that area because it's ad adherent to the uh, pleura or close to the chest wall. Sir, one more question to you. Um, do you think that uh, if this patient had come over now, do you think a higher technology like proton therapy will be indicated or not? See, uh, to be honest with you, whether it is proton or photon, uh, the results would be the same. It is only the dosimetry that we are playing here. 
So with stereotactic body or radiotherapy with photon is practically possible, which we normally, which we do it regularly at our center. We have more than more than 42 patients uh, uh, data to support uh, this. Uh, and world over, there are several patients which have been treated with uh, standard photon therapy. Having said that, proton would certainly have an advantage because it is a localized lesion at posterior wall. Uh, we can have single direct uh, field or two field proton therapy where the road dose to the heart and lungs could be much reduced if we use proton therapy. Thank you, sir. Um, next slide. I also, I told you that I am a registrar patient in the case, but remember, all these patients are also going to come with second opinions. So that's also something that I want to tell the panelists. And this patient had a second opinion um, in 2016 with Professor Ramesh Rangan, who is from University of Washington School of Medicine, and he's also the director of SCCA Proton Center in Seattle. And he is considered a, as one of the foremost experts in lung proton therapy. So this is what he had to say, Dr. Raja. I think proton is not needed. Hypofractionated radiation is fine. As beautifully covered by Dr. Vijayanda Reddy, he talked about chest wall pain syndrome. And he suggested that we should approach this with what they called as an NCIC approach. And he sent the paper wherein he had hypofractionation like uh, you know, 400 CGY into 15. And that's what, next slide. And this is what really happened to that patient, that this patient presented in 2016, went on to receive 60 GY TOTO SBRT. And you would see that six months later in March 2017, the image is kind of dimming. And one year later in August 2017, you would see that the lesion appears to be almost inactive. And uh, thank you, Vijayantar sir, to be point on the point. Next slide. Raja, one question. Um, Govind, yes. Uh, quickly, please. Raja, you said this, pa this patient came with hyponatremia. Yes. Yes. So I recently had a yeah. I recently had a patient who came again like this with hyponatremia, and uh, we really looked for it, and he also found to uh, was found to have adrenal hematosis. Yeah, yeah. No, we. I tell you, Govind. I mean, yeah. I mean, there are ten to twelve cases, but I take your point. Well worked up, including yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. work up, including. So what, yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. So what happened to the hyponatremia after you gave right. him radiation? This correction all settled. Down. Okay, okay, thanks. And now it's five years down the line. Okay, patient is still fine. Sure, okay. sure. So there are some more stories behind the patient that's different. Okay, now thanks. I will, I will come to uh, another patient, and I'm going to come back, come to you, uh, Doctor Goin Babu, with this. Yeah, yeah. Next slide. So we all now heard, you know, beautiful lectures from all the uh, all the previous speakers on how they would approach EGFR mutation now in 2020. But um, the Govind Babu, this is a patient who is, you know, around 59 to 60, a lady with absolutely normal, uh, you know, performance status. And I'm your registrar. I'm coming and asking you, sir. This patient, we sent the, you know. Um, Oncomine focus assay, and uh, this is the result, has got an EGFR L85R, 44%. And, uh, you know, uh, what, will, what should I tell the patient? What should I plan? Dr. Govind Babu. Uh, yeah, what is the rest of her workup? Everything else is other, I mean, advanced metastatic, okay. non-portal lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, yeah. and so, the point of discussion is, this yeah. is their EGFR mutation. Correct. What more comes to your mind after after all so these pictures? After and... listening to all the talks, I will definitely give her the option of osimertinib. Oh. Any other choice would you have, Dr. Govind? Uh, the other one is rifatinib, but now there is data for uh, uh, osimertinib with the rarer mutations as well. So I think that would be a better option to I'm give just trying patient. to figure out what every, everyone actually decides in the clinic on a day-to-day -day basis. And yeah. So I'll move on to another of the panelists. I will ask Dr. Sivanti Lemai. Um, this patient comes to you, uh, Dr. Sivanti. And uh, what will be your answer to your registrar that what's going to be your first line? And are you thinking about a second line? Are you already sequencing in your mind? Uh, what is your For me, 
Yeah, thank you for the question. So for me, I would offer uh, osimertinib, although um, we know that the higher uh, data is with EGFR exon 19. Uh, having said that, the easiest to tolerate best drug is osimertinib. If cost is not a restraint or a constraint for the patient, of course, osimertinib. Okay. If I take okay. out cost uh, from the equation or I throw in cost into the equation and you are asked to cross your heart and say, what about the Tata data? What about uh, you know, the, uh, the Japanese data? Are you swayed by all that? So what is your decision today? So uh, two things that are critical. This is a very easy to tolerate drug. Uh, this also works, you know, in, in, so this patient doesn't have evidence of blood brain barrier, but this is a protective drug for uh, CNS penetration as well. So in, in all with the quality of life, uh, with the ease of delivery, with just being a pill, this is the drug. If there is a reason for the patient to not be able to take that, then I will consider all the others that Senthil presented, wherein a fit a young patient is a requirement, and uh, yes, uh, Tata okay. data that definitely very, stands very out. Good. No problem at all this thing. Anyway, thank you. You have already given your perspective. It's only about giving the perspective on the spot to your registrar. Next slide. So um, here we are going to next slide, please. And here is the case. We'll again illustrate this point. Next slide. In quick summary, this is a two-year-old patient with extensive metastatic polydeficient adenocarcinoma with liver, spleen, and bone. And this patient has presented this mutation analysis. Next slide. That's the result we had. And uh, this patient presented two years ago. Uh, in, um, in June 2018, the patient presents and was found to have, you know, exon 19 deletion and was also found to have, at the same time, at presentation, T790 mutation was detected. So I'll turn to Dr. Amit Verma. Uh, Amit, um, 2018, your perspective, and then 2020, your perspective. You can argue it both ways. Dr. Amit. Uh, so, so I think uh, 2018 and now, the treatment would be the same. Osim Martini would be the first choice. And... Um, Doctor, yeah. yeah. So, Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. we are able to hear you. We are able to hear you. Yeah, so osimertinib will be the first choice. Um, what we have learned over the period is that um, osimertinib gives better, you can say, advantage if we start early on. Uh, but if I were in 2018, the, definitely the first choice would be nantin deletion. So it would be afatinib would be the first choice in 2018. But now it will be osimertinib. So the crux of the question here is only one thing, Amit, that uh, you know, the percentage of patients who are going to present with uh, um, T790 at presentation um, at first diagnosis about 2-3%. So is it going to necessarily uh, be a factor in considering your first line choice or not? Earlier, apparently these patients were there and we couldn't know and uh, so we were always happily treating. So. What is your comment on that, Amit? And then I'll go to Vamsi next. Yes, so the T790 mutation um, is definitely picked up um, at the onset also in a few subsets. But the L frequency is so less that it is not um, uh, worth to treat till we uh, see a surge in the T790, T790M or failure to the first generation TK or second generation TK. Um, but with the new data, going with the osimertinib is a different decision, but uh, this philosophy of using TKI one generation and second generation followed by third uh, makes a better sense uh, to see and select the patient population. Once you see more t 7 m definitely you have a drug to, to control. Next the slide. Next slide. So in 2018, just then the, you know, July 2018, the flora data had come out and we were also gung-ho and this patient was put on first line osimertinib. Next slide. And you can see from July to September, you can see the excellent response. Next slide. In all areas and the patient had 
excellent improvement in the in the in the performance status and the patient still continues to be on osimertinib next slide so therefore the question to vamsi is this dr vamsi i have a newly diagnosed stage 4 non small cell lung cancer patient who is initiated on a tki okay i'm not um, specifying which tki whatever is the driver mutation accordingly but after 2 to 3 months the patient shows signs of progression there may be the patient can have two options either i mean two variations either has brain met or no brain met what will be your next step uh, what do you think you should do in in these uh, you know on uh, on oncogen driver mutated uh, patients vamsi okay so i will make a couple of assumptions sir that we have a peak or not and then how do you address brain met or not that's all sure so a uh, couple of assumptions i assume that we have done a proper uh, egfr and single mutation it's not a t790m baseline something like that no now if the patient has progressed within 3 months a frank progression not an oligo progression yeah. uh, we would need to change the protocol now uh, if it was a first generation or second generation i would do a liquid biopsy for the uh, osimertinib and t790m if it was upfront osimertinib i would definitely do a rebiopsy to look for molecular markers exactly. biomarkers for resistance would be i would look for the met i would look for probably her2 as well and i'd also look for any transformation though within 3 month transformation is very unlikely uh, coming to brain mets uh, if it is a oligo progression with a single brain met and other lesions well controlled i would give local rt to the brain met alone if it is a progression in systemic and brain then we have to change the therapy next slide thank you vamsi that's exactly what was told by you know dr anatasios from mayo clinic and rebiopsy the point that i was trying to illustrate in 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 clearly driver mutated patients you have chosen a specific drug but you see an early progress so what do you do that's what i was trying to figure out and uh, i mean rebiopsy you have touched upon oligo progression and you have also touched upon switching to a drug that has got a cns penetrant tk so that's the essence of uh, this thank you for capturing that next slide but then sometimes it's not always the driver mutated patients it could be somebody else who has a similar scenario let's see how to approach that next slide so this is a 64 year old patient who presents with profound dyspnea massive pleural effusion and has got a positive pleural biopsy adenocarcinoma next slide and that's the picture you can see the massive pleural effusion next slide and metastatic adenocarcinoma was to, i mean everything was negative at presentation egfr alk ros pdl1 again this was you know a couple of years ago that's all we had we didn't have a complete ngs at the time everything negative so then we decided to go on to put this patient on chemotherapy next slide had a partial response normal expected response with chemotherapy next slide and continued on maintenance next slide here comes the catch after 18 to 19 degrees uh, 18 doses of uh, pemetrexid maintenance has a progression so this has no known uh, mutation govin so how do you approach this patient's progression dr uh, raja would definitely do a rebiopsy and see for any markers now at, at this point of time okay great dot 70 if there are no markers then i would yeah definitely Yeah, thank you. So, if there are no other mutations that we see, then probably I will shift the chemotherapy to something else that I can offer. Second line chemo. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Got some. Yeah, so uh, I would re-biopsy, and uh, this is a single site uh, of activity, uh, so one has to keep that in mind as well. So, this patient, as both of you advised, we have done the re-biopsy. Okay. and uh, it now, was for ngs this was gone to this is gone to um, you know uh -huh. one and i mind you i'm talking about 2018 next slide has got a you know a uncommon mutation next slide and that is exon 20 insertion and a763 and y764 so the point is we have an uncommon mutation on 
progression of a patient who was treated with chemotherapy originally not known to have a mutation so coming to dr amit you have an uncommon mutation what can i do dr amit uh so definitely it's a tricky situation but afatinib has shown some um, uh, responses in these situations when you have insertions in exon 20 so that can be tried in this patient and um, uh, but if you want to go beyond i think uh, chemotherapy second line chemotherapy is definitely an option immunotherapy is another option which we can still try um, or combining immuno with chemo will be the the other options but Thank single you. agent tki yeah Thank you. Somebody, somebody in the in the in the chat box wanted a poisotinib, and uh, they were also gracious to grant that if you don't have it, you can use a fatinib. Next slide. And he was started on a fatinib on your advice. This was in May two thousand nineteen, and you already see that there is again a partial response. Next slide. And uh, this patient, um, unfortunately, progressed. Uh, after a fatinib about 7 8 months this is february 2020 has got new brain secondaries has also got increase in the lung and the rest of the disease so vamsi what can we do now on a fatinib what can we do now chemo so, done uh, fatinib done progression now so to be honest this is behaving much better than the typical exon 20 insertion actually this has been almost uh, close to 2 years so it's done well uh at this point i would probably either put them on a different chemotherapy protocol something like a paclitaxel carboplatin or else we can go with an abcp type protocol now abcp would not have specifically looked at this subset they have looked at egfr mutation but exon 20 insertion i am not aware but uh, for lack of anything better that's an option or else only chemotherapy is an option okay the point that i was trying to come at is you know it was covered by some of the previous speakers that you know we know the typical progression and uh, what happens in first generation tkis and the data on second generation progression and how to manage them you did hear you know some beautiful data from the previous speaker so that's the point that is illustrated in this case so next slide next slide kashish so this patient went on to do another you know liquid biopsy in gordon 360 and here comes the result has got now the same egfr uh, exon 20 insertion is still persistent you can see but is now detected to have t790 mutation dr govin we come back to you what do we do dr govin not audible dr sevanthi Yeah. So, uh, you know, you see here, osimertinib is in is is in both, and I was just typing in the chat box. There is data with uh, double dose or osimertinib. There's a phase two ongoing trial. There is the initial signaling. So one would think osimertinib for sure. Although when you look at the structure of uh, exon twenty insertion, the insertion site is very tight, and it. only allows for a smaller molecule for afatinib is that molecule but you've already exhausted that so i would consider osimertinib here specifically because there's a t790m clone as well so one of the chat box question is why did i do another biopsy that's what and i must confess that this is a patient driven he has heard about gordon 360 but thank you for your comments next slide govin so uh, you know uh, i'm coming to you with a more difficult case um next slide every patient now we are routinely doing these mutation analysis no other choice this is a lady who is 78 advanced non small cell lung ca adenocarcinoma has been found to have ret fusion go in what can we do now uh, i i don't think we have any drug right now uh, i think there are trials on going so i have not come across a uh, ret fusion so far so i think raja you have to answer this question <laughs> I'm Cabozentinib can be tried. So Cabozentinib. Sorry. Cabozentinib. 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 That. So uh, you know, uh, I mean, you know, everybody is typing. Centil is also typed. Cabozentinib <laughs> and all that. Totally agreed. So we did try to get Cabozentinib on uh, the sun is in US, and uh, we are trying to uh, you know uh, apply it in a, a compassionate bit. But that's not the point. The point is this. apparently uh, i hope that one of you can answer apparently unlike the 
CDFR and ALK and uh, even the ROS1 and uh, some of that we have understood. The RET and NTRK are totally different, I believe. Even if you see a change and they are not necessarily the same and they may not respond to kind of drive. So a bit of a confusion, NTRK and all that. Stuff. So can anyone take that question? Um, can uh, Dr. Uh, Wamsi take that question? Sure. Uh, NTRK is actually not very easy thing to test. Okay. What we found even in one patient was we had some low level of NTRK mutation present. The fusion that is there may need to be confirmed by an IHC to make sure that it's actually an expressing fusion and right. not necessarily a report on the NGS which says NTRK plus is going to be an indicator of efficacy. So that was the uh, foundation what they said. So you need to confirm with an IHC which we don't have here. Yeah, thank you for illustrating that point. That's what something similar I was trying to bring. Uh, we'll move on. There are a couple of other good cases. Next slide. And this patient, you know, in short, this is another gentleman who presents to us, you know, all the lectures that you had about brain meds and all that. This patient um, it has got, uh, you know, multiple small brain meds in frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal. Small. All of them are sub-centimeter, two to three, four millimeters kind of thing. Absolutely asymptomatic. When we worked up for a CA lung advanced disease, this is what we picked up. And when we did the focus assay, we had an exon 18 deletion. So the point that I'm trying to bring is that there's an uncommon mutation and there are some small, small brain met and it is asymptomatic. So I will now come to Dr. Vijayanth Reddy. Sir, would you want to compulsorily radiate this patient or wait and watch? No, I would always uh, wait and watch in such kind of patients, especially if they are multiple and they're very small and nothing is going to be of any benefit by adding radiation. It'll only cause morbidity. The so be mindful of the case. quality of life. Totally agree, yes. sir. Amit, would you want to pick the choice of which first-line drug you will choose given this permutation? Uncommon mutation, <laughs> there are few small so brain meds under people. Yeah, so we know afatinib uh, works uh, quite good for uncommon mutations and have, do have some bin penetration. So afatinib would be my choice. Next slide. So this patient was put on a TK. I'll come to that. And uh, that's uh, the EGFR, you know, rare mutation. Next slide. What happened is after three months, we did a scan. The scan showed kind of marginal increase in the right lower lobe, but then there is a reduction in everywhere else and the rest was stable. So can I say that it is, uh, uh, it's, it's an oligo progression in one place. Then again, uh, would you have to radiate all oligo progression or not? That's the question I wanted to ask. And then we'll finally come to the drug choice. Dr. Vijayandreddy, sir. Sorry, I thought the question is Asymptomatic oligo progression. Would you still radiate or not? Uh, single oligomet, you mean? In the, in the, in the, sorry, sorry, sorry. Mild increase in the uh, lung uh, lobe alone, but everything else was stable. Yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good case to discuss on, and you should certainly consider uh, giving uh, SBRT to such lesions. Okay. Next slide. We went on to observe this patient, but unfortunately, another three months later, he had a profound increase. Next slide. That's what he had a, a prolific systemic uh, increase. Next slide. And the brain meds have, uh, this is the Jan 2020, as I said, and that's the May 2020 has increased. Next slide. And now has got a good progression in the brain lesions. And this patient was on, on osimertinib, actually. I just wanted to tell you that because we thought osimertinib, CNS data, etc. That's why we put, but this is, this, is the, this is what exactly happened to the patient. Next slide. And that's the brain lesion. Dr. Vijayandreddy has already answered that he would observe, but at this point, we definitely need his help. So we have already referred to the radiation team and uh, um, they are doing hippocampal sparing radiation for this. Next slide. So we'll come with some other patient, uh, you know, a few more patients whenever the, uh, whenever the, organizer want, we can. But uh, this patient illustrates that sometimes we have more than one pathway to choose. What do we do? Next slide. 63-year-old patient, extensive adenocarcinoma, pleural effusion, has got a pdl one 20% positive. Next slide. 
has got a Keras positivity and an EGFR exon 20 um, mutation or now. So I have uh, three different pathway, somewhat difficult. So if it's difficult, I have to come back to Govin. What do we do? Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Raja. Uh, now, you know, we have actually uh, published four uh, case reports of KRAS and uh, uh, EGFR together. Now that uh, this uh, G12 C, there is a drug. Uh, but uh, here, uh, because it's the EGFR, and uh, the dictum is that even if PDL1 is positive, but there is a, one of the driver mutations positive, so you first treat the targeted uh, uh, therapy for the driver mutation. So that's what I would do. Uh, so I will treat uh, this patient with uh, an EGFR targeted drug. So which and all we've already discussed. So my personal preference here would be uh, osimertinib uh, for this patient. Next slide. Um, so you would ignore the uh, the PDL one uh, totally under. I would not ignore. ignore. It is not a question of ignoring. Uh, the thing is that uh, when you have a driver mutation, uh, the immunotherapy does uh, does not work very well. So okay. I would first. Uh, Try and target the driver mutation. Vamsi, you put your hand. Sir, yeah. Coming to yes, you. Sir. Sir. Slightly more complicated uh, situation than the previous okay. patient. This is another patient who is 52 year old, has got extensive disease, but please note most of it is spine, bone, adrenal, and all secondaries. This patient presents to us in February 2020. Next slide. And that's the presentation. Next slide. And. Uh, Presentation, next slide. And next slide. Has got this. Wamsi, he has got uh, a 90 to 95% PDL1, but that's not the only thing. Next slide. He has got a KRAS positivity. So I want to ask you in patient who has got a very high score on PDL1, if there is some other confounding factor like a KRAS. Um, does it dampen your enthusiasm and what would you do? Uh, it would definitely dampen my enthusiasm. Uh, would prefer uh, a marker if you have, like in this case, it's a KRAS and only 4.6%, which is a little difficult here. In this patient, maybe immunotherapy may immunotherapy. still be a good option. May still be a good option. Uh, but the pre but you know if the care if they have any other marker and immunotherapy will not be an option so that's very clear EGFR IL cross if you have positive definitely Keras immunotherapy is not the first option got it next slide yeah next slide dr, dr. dr. raja yes keras keras mutation is also a good biomarker for response to immunotherapy though it's yes a actually i was also going to say that keras would be a good Absolutely. marker Thank you for saying that, but I'm going to show that the patient did not respond to all. <laughs> That's it. You know, look at this patient. Simply is recurring presentation. So what do you do? So it's not that easy, you see. Five, and six, slide, again. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So this is the point. Uh, please go back to the previous slide. You have exposed me. So that <laughs> point I was going to state in a 62-year-old patient who has got a 70% PDL1 positivity and no other driver mutation, so on and so forth. And uh, uh, I mean, would you want to use pembrolizumab as a monotherapy or pembrolizumab with chemotherapy or any other immuno-oncology agent or you, or you sold about the doublet therapy? So what will be your preference? I just want to say that these patients come with second opinion. Dr. Sivanti. Since you want so the disease burden, the disease burden decides for me. If, uh, even if it is TPS of seventy percent and over, if there is large disease burden, I would consider adding a combination: okay. chemotherapy plus pembrolizumab. And here you are saying T four. So that, was this patient symptomatic? You know how uh, large was the primary? And that would determine if the patient is comfortable. I don't need a, a quick response. I would go with monotherapy with pembrolizumab. Okay. Uh, only one more, one question to one other panelist. Would anybody want a monotherapy or a doublet therapy? Maybe I'll switch. I'll come to Amit. Vamsi, mono or so Here, I would go with a mono, sir. You have written a M1A, as Dr. Sindhil has very helpfully pointed out in the chat right. column. Right. So probably the metastatic load may not be very high. So okay. there, like Dr. Serenti says, monotherapy is good. 
uh, I mean the rest, the overall survival is better with the monotherapy. The rest, the side Thank effects you. are much lesser. So monotherapy. Dr. Raja, I should consider uh, local therapy after you get a remission with this whatever monotherapy or immunotherapy this, that you this, do. This patient is going to come to you eventually. Yes, I'm coming. <laughs> this is this is an opinion from Vanderbilt University, and you would see that. They look at this opinion that in patients who has a bigger load, exactly like what you pointed out, that's when we want to use everything. And honestly and personally. I have done this few times. The patients have rapidly deteriorated when I wanted to put everything together. So I'm not a big fan of pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy in patients who had more than 50%. That's the opinion from Leora Horn. Next slide. Very similar opinion from Joshua Bomi. Next slide. And that's what all of you said. And Senthil also agrees. He says, thank you. <laughs> and so this patient, if it turns out to be a PDL one less than 49%, what do we do? Next slide. Add 1%. Okay, 1% or more. Talk to the so, pathologist. Right, no problem. So I have opened the, so this patient is, is good to show you the second opinion. Now, right. showing the second opinion. Now, so, Govind, you want to do what? Single agent or, or you know, multiple agents. You would go with chemo or monotherapy or all put together. Less than 49. I would definitely see what the performance status of the patient is. And uh, here, yes, if the patient performance status is good, can tolerate chemotherapy, then I would definitely give a combination of immunotherapy plus chemotherapy for this patient. Again, you know, 4950 is a very dicey thing, you know. Mamsi, <laughs> so that's a, why I said I will add 1%. Is, is, it, is it not, Mamsi, as Sintil is also pointing out, is it not a little intrigue that above 50% we want yeah. be below we want to combine everything so what's your comment on yeah. that meanwhile we'll show we'll show the next slide also please i would say look we have to follow the data where it is i mean agreed that 50 is a cutoff which they've used but less than 50 categorically the response has been less so i would still go with that and say pembro with immuno uh, with com chemo combination the monotherapy data is really not that great in the k189 so I, I mean the sorry K042. So I would actually go with the combination. Just want to add that you know two of the opinions emphasize that if the patient has got a, is elderly and then has got a limited uh, volume disease would still consider monotherapy. That's all three out of three. That's what they said. Next slide. This patient has been you know uh, initiated on whatever choice of your immune therapy and has responded very well. Now the son comes back and tells you that I have an overwhelming financial burden. Can I really stop it for some time? Um, that's the question that he is trying to ask. Will you agree to stop if the patient is really doing well? Say he has crossed one year or let's say two years. Dr. Seventy. Yeah, so um, I have done this in the resource limitations one has to consider. And uh, a lot of these patients will still remain in response. For those who come back with disease, you could make the case to re-challenge. Um, and some of them do not respond after that, but majority of them do. So uh, I would say if there is a financial burden, one could um, complete a two-year time period and then uh, stop. Perfect. Next slide. Um, that's the opinion from Dana Faber and uh, you know, um, two years. Next slide. We'll come to that why and everybody is aware of this data. You know, Checkmate 153. In this entire discussion, we have never shown any data. You know, just this one alone, please allow. The, the registrar is also appearing for some exam. So he has read up something and has shown you. Next slide. And the next slide. I like exactly what you pointed out. Discontinuation. And then restarting with the nivolumab um, is still okay. And this is the first randomized study to establish the milestone two year. That's what all of them pointed out. And uh, so thank you for pointing it that out. Next slide. Now this patient has got brain meds. Whom else we can go? We can't go anybody else other than to Vijayan the Reddy. Sir, would yeah. you want to give RT first and then newly diagnosed patient with a brain met has all the components that can suggest immunotherapy. Would you want to give, you talked about RT in uh, driver, uh, you know, mutation driven cancers, but what about immunotherapy patients? Do you give RT first or you want to wait still the immunotherapy works and hold on RT? How will be your approach 
in yeah. the accidentally detected lesion, small lesions with no edema, no uh, no symptoms on the patient, I would certainly wait and watch. But if there are one or two or even five, I would like to do SRS. Uh, although, I mean, if they are sizable and they are causing any kind of edema or symptoms, certainly treat them first uh, and then go for immunotherapy. Right. Vamsi is saying that RTS at some point. Next slide. So I meant early. So do not delay RT till patient becomes symptomatic for six to 10 months. I was adding actually that you start off your IO within two, three weeks, add the radiation early. Do not keep it at progression. Vamsi is saying that RT early. Sorry, you have to just respond to that at some point and early. That's what he says. Vijayan, sir, you would respond. To that. And right. that's See, we, we, when you look at the MRI scan and if you look at small lesions yeah, yeah. started in the brain, those kind of patients are not good candidates for radiation. So the giving 30 gray in 10 fractions is as good as not doing anything. They actually become very sick and they'll be ineligible to go for any kind of chemotherapy or immunotherapy at a later date. So I am not very keen to do that. But if you have around eight to 10 lesions, which are very well defined, yes, which yes. Are sizable, and then we would certainly do whole brain RT with uh, SIB, what you call simultaneous integrated boost to those big lesions. So those kind of patients, certainly we would start, even though the patient is not symptomatic, which is expected to be symptomatic sooner than later. Uh, next slide. Meanwhile, I'm also just reading one comment from Professor Pankaj Shah, yes. who is my teacher, guru, and everything. He has written that he is so proud to see his registrar. You know, I mean, I'm still continuing to be a sir. Uh, all my salute to you, sir. Everything that uh, it's all your blessing, sir. Thank you, sir. And you know, this patient uh, is on immunotherapy and has. Um, you know, this is a tricky situation. We'll come to all your panelists and this is going to be the last case. The patient is on immunotherapy and has shown some progression after two cycles. What would you do in such situation? Next slide. I'm opening this up. I'll ask Vamsi. Sir, uh, depends on where the progression is. If it is in the same sites and only slight increase in size, I would still keep an eye, uh, keep it as a pseudo progression and wait for some time. If it's okay. a gross progression, multiple new sites, then it's probably a hyper progression. In which case, I would stop the IO and switch to a chemotherapy. Go in, patient factor. Well, Raja will also like to see how symptomatically he is worsened. If Next the time. symptoms are worse, then it is definitely a progression. If it is not, if it is mild, then I would really wait and uh, continue the immunotherapy and reassess maybe uh, much earlier, maybe after four weeks uh, or six weeks to see what exactly has happened to the so-called progression. And okay. then I would take Last it. Last set up. of questions. Thank you, Govind. Last set of questions. And there is a patient who has responded well to immunotherapy, but you had to discontinue due to some immune-related uh, adverse events. They had to be stopped. And the patient is doing well after some time. Would you want to restart? And then there is another situation wherein a patient who was given, you know, um, uh, uh, after progression was given a second line chemotherapy, say some non IO therapy was given, and then again continues to have a second progression. Would you want to re challenge? Basically, it's about re challenging with immunotherapy in a situation okay. where there was an adverse event, and then in another event wherein there is a progression after a second line option, say salvage chemotherapy. This is the last set of questions. So I'm going to run to all of you, Dr. Seventy. Reach out. Yeah. So first uh, answer, retreatment, yes. Uh, if the IRAE has gone to less than equal to grade one, I would consider re-challenging uh, if the patient was benefiting, absolutely. Re-challenging in the second setting is more controversial. I don't think we have... I'm not aware of data where you could bring back with the same uh, drug after uh, exposure to chemotherapy with the same uh, drug of, with which the patient progressed. If you have a combination available as a clinical trial, I would consider that or add a CTLA-4 antibody to that. There should be an angle. Fine. Good. Second sli Next slide. So this is the two situation. You stop due to I mean, uh, adverse event or you stop, treated something and has progressed and all. We ourselves have salvaged with a double antibody, um, uh, sorry, double immunotherapy, and so that's fine. And so we're coming to Amit. Uh, what is your final take on re-challenge? And uh, next slide. 
I would I would recommend to do a repeat biopsy to look at the PDL1 expression. I'm going to finish. If it, yeah, if it is higher, then your confidence goes up, and you should still continue I I O, because there are recommendations regarding giving I O beyond progression also. So you may have an advantage to challenging the patient. So that's the guideline, and uh, you know, um, it's not. Some of them would say that it is not, but you decide. based on the situations and as uh, you know it, it this is purely at this point in time it is still art of medicine there rather than you know data medicine at this point in this area next slide so i leave you all with this and uh, you know uh, thank you for allowing me to be your registrar i really learned quite a bit from all of you and thank you all the panelists i give it over back to kashish thank you thank you so thank much you. sir yeah that was really a fantastic uh, set of cases i think it was absolutely amazing and nobody wanted you to stop raja <laughs> you've done a great job uh, we've had so many comments and questions if dr madan pia is here he had a important question about the cost of therapy madan if you are there we will unmute you uh, madan sir we've unmuted you please Are go panelists will answer i'm only okay. Uh, yeah, I just had a question about this proton therapy. I was a bit curious because the price is very high, and I just wanted to know the price. You know, how much would it cost on average? Sinivas, uh, are you there? Okay? Proton cost, Sinivas. Sir, I'll just unmute you one minute. Yeah, Sinivas, you are there. Yes. Sinivas. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I heard the question. The cost of the proton therapy would be. Between twenty uh, to thirty lakhs Indian currency, Indian rupees. Uh, Depends. Ask confession. Would you give some confession for me? If if uh, Dr. Raja says, uh, sir, says, uh, obviously the confession is given, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> sir, uh, Ravi Jaiswal had a question. Can we unmute Ravi Jaiswal, please? Ravi, we uh, try Dr. to. Ravi, unmute. you'll have to unmute your yeah, mic. Yeah. Correct. Uh, thank you, sir. I, I uh, got the answer to my question. It was about uh, the overall survival of the Narona et al. study would be better than or equal to the Osimertinib data. Then could we consider this, and it will be the end of the debate. But I already uh, got the answer to the question. Thank you. Yes. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks very much. Virat is there. Can we unmute Virat, please? He had a comment or a question. Virat, you will have to unmute yourself. We can't unmute you. Uh, what is the dose of dexa that is given? Actually, there is confusion. What dose to give? And also, the PID or the IV which should be followed. Can't hear. Somebody wants to know the dexa dose, and um... dexa for leptomeningeal disease. Correct. Yeah. So and... I had said uh, actually, it's eight milligram twice daily. You can even start with eight milligram three times daily and. Quickly go down. I just had a patient, so and it should be given only for uh, uh, high ICP, and that you figure out with the CSF manometry. Excellent, Dr. Rajesh Bolam. Oh, he just left. He was there for a while. Babita is there. If we can unmute Babita, Babita, can you unmute oh, yeah, yourself? Babita is not there. Okay, she is also not there. then dr sardana shefali sardana and you have to unmute your mic yeah yes sir go so, ahead sir excellent panel discussion so really uh, worthwhile and enjoyed just i made a comment that i also had a patient of ret mutation positive and uh, in the scarcity of ability of any working medication we started him on abcp protocol and 6 months now down the line so it's a good response to continuing with that so that's what i want <laughs> excellent so can we take the final comments by dr pankaj shah hello sir good evening sir, sir good evening sir Uh, Pankaj sir, you have to uh, test your mic once. We are unable to hear you. 
in the meantime can we start asking the questions from the personal chat please uh, can i request dr bhavesh poladia to please ask his questions sir please go ahead uh, i just wanted actually dr senthil or any of the uh, uh, is there any trial which is contemplated where osimertinib will be added with chemotherapy uh, instead of just jefferin yes, yes, yes. Well, yes, uh, Bhavesh, there is an ongoing study, so we will, uh, you know, await the results of that study. There is a study that's combining chemo plus osimertinib. It's a Flora 2. Flora 2 study, chemo plus osimertinib. Bhavesh, you have another two questions. Yes, Please sir. go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, if there are a combination, uh, as we have seen that there is, if there are two combination of EGFR mutation analysis, uh, mutations which are present, we prefer osimertinib. It is the same if there are more than two uh, mutations which are seen on a NGS for EGFR. Or we go for any specific uh, uh, TKI. Like if it is 19, exon 19 positive, 790M positive, uh, exon 20 positive. If it, if it is coming into more than two or three, uh, then should we choose according to uh, uh, the highest or the worst prognostic this thing? Or Osimertinib is the answer for all of them. So, so you could look at it in two ways, Bhavesh. One is this is a situation that's called as a complex mutation where you have more than one mutation. So there are two ways of approaching. One is to look at what's the allele frequency because the highest allele frequency is what is uh, the driver at that point in time. But here, since all the three are EGFR, all the three are drivers. So you would choose a drug that will work in uncommon mutations. If T790M is one of those mutations, then you will certainly use osimertinib there. But afatinib is also a reasonable choice in this kind of a situation. Perfect. Uh, one more. Jayanti uh, Patel, sorry, last side. you want to ask last your side. question? Last, last question, sir. Oh, Bhavesh, go ahead, please. Okay. Sorry. Uh, sir, uh, so are we doing uh, EGFR and uh, PDL1 or all the uh, mutation analysis even in patients, those who are not stage 4? Is it a routine at all centers or somebody has uh, started doing it or uh, what is the talk, what is the take on uh, this? So we are doing this, uh, we are doing on early stage uh, as well, mainly for, uh, for data right now. But I think now we have the Adura study and earlier also they have been, um, you know, uh, looking at locally advanced uh, EGFR positive uh, lung cancer. So it's worth collecting that data and now you will have implementation as well. Jayanti Patel, can you ask your question? And then we'll yeah. take Raja Jindal. Yeah, it was an excellent presentation. We all enjoyed it. I just want to know that the role of Bivasazume was not taken into consideration anywhere into the discussion. So, uh, sir, can I answer? Please go ahead. So, we didn't discuss, I didn't discuss Bevacizumab as part of my presentation primarily because uh, of lack of time. So, there are combination studies which shows that the progression-free survival is around 16 months, though not as high as osimertinib at this point in time. Uh, but the reason why I also didn't discuss it is because there's no overall survival benefit for the combination at this point in time. The NEJ study that will be read at NASCO this weekend also is not showing an overall survival benefit. The second important thing is that the adverse event profile of these studies is also bad. There's a 30% discontinuation rate for adverse events. So that's the reason why it's not one of those preferred combinations for patients with EGFR mutant disease at this point in time. In the future, if you get trials which show that the overall survival benefit is there or if the uh, adverse event profile is uh, much better, then probably that will come up as one of the options. All right. Thanks, Anthil. Before Rajesh asks his question, I'm just going to read out what BB has said. What is the best option if a mutant patient on first line osimertinib progresses within three months? Have you seen such faster progression in your patients? Uh, so I am yet to see, but there are always, you know, the response rates for osimertinib is around 85%. Uh, so there's about 7-8% of stable disease. So 5% of patients will progress even if there is an EGFR mutation. One should not uh, think that, uh, you know, there's always going to be a response and great response for all patients. All right. So in a situation like that, testing again is one possibility or the best thing would be to go to uh, ABCP, 
that's what i would do in a situation like that because that's a bad patient you want to put all your uh, you know you want to put your best foot forward Excellent. So one of my patients uh, progressed at at five months, and when biopsied, she had actually already transformed into squamous. So she was mixed adenosquamous, EGFR exon nineteen, rebiopsy squamous alone, all EGFR nineteen clone gone. And make sure you're ruling out small cell transformation, though it doesn't occur yeah. so early. But that's another thing that you need to look at if it's three months. Rajesh Jindal. I you... just had an observation to make. Please, that it was a lovely webinar we had, and I was just wondering if you could have a repeat of this sometime later. Absolutely, we are here. If it makes you uh, something that is useful, uh, definitely we would love to have it repeated. But Thank I you. think it's the is the star uh, faculty who have done such a great job. Yes, sir. Arun Sai from Kathmandu. He has a question. Please go ahead, Arun. Arun, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, you are Hello. unmuted. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so good evening, sir. Excellent discussion. I enjoyed. So, we have a, like uh, osimertinib shortage here in Nepal. So, those patients who are getting osimertinib, can we go with the afatinib or first generation TKI, or should we go with the chemo? So, what is the best? Seventy. Will you take the question? Osimertinib yeah. was being given to the patient. now because of shortage it's not available what should the doctor do the patient has not progressed patient is was still responding to osimertinib right so i have had this situation sir where uh, for some reason or the other you're not able to give for monetary reasons uh, specifically you're not able to continue on osimertinib and then the patient just does not wish to go with chemotherapy i have gone to afatinib although when you look at switching so there isn't enough uh, Uh, data to support switching TKIs between osimertinib and uh, afatinib and stuff like that, and there is some concept of resistance development when you do uh, something like that. Having said that, in real life, I've had to challenge with another TKI. In 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 my case, the choice has been afatinib uh, because there is uh, comparable data with afatinib. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. That's great. Yeah. Have I missed out anybody's question? Um. So, can we have uh, Dr. Ajay, ba Dr. Ajay Bapna's uh, question? Please, please, absolutely. Ajay, please go ahead. Uh, Ajay, sir, you have to unmute your mic. I just wanted to know from Dr. Sevanti or Dr. Santil any experience during clinical trial about cell percutaneum or AMG one five zero. So, no, I have not had any uh, experience with AMG one five zero, but. Uh, I've sent a patient for a trial uh, to MD Anderson for this medicine specifically. Uh, he hasn't been enrolled yet. And selpatinib. Selpatinib. I have I've had experience, and my patient did respond to the drug. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, around the six months ago that we started the medicine, and the patient has responded, but not with AMG uh, drug. I've not had any personal experience. Yeah, thank you. So, so uh, Ajay, Ajay, we have started our first patient on salpicatinib now. That's a patient who has survived 12 years with an EGFR mutation diagnosed with a brain metastasis. He was on cabozantinib for a year, stable disease. I mean, off the sequence of things that were done, I don't want to go into that sequence. But the latest in that sequence is salpicatinib. One month, symptomatically better, not yet evaluated. All right. Anybody else left? For the questions pending, uh, so Dr. Bhavesh Pulladia has another question. Okay, uh, go Bhavesh, ahead, Bhavesh. I think Dr. Santil uh, answered that. I was just uh, curious whether, uh, like ABCP, whether uh, osimertinib will be added to BCP to just intensify the treatment in first line. Uh, if yes, why? And I mean, I mean uh, if no, why? Like, if it is like uh, immunotherapy can be added to BCP, why not osimertinib to BCP? Santil, uh, you want to take that? Oh yes. So it uh, the, in theory it sounds uh, good, but I think one of the uh, so if the uh, if the flora two comes out to be positive, this is something that we need to think of because now at this point in time the combination is certainly toxic. So if we get to the point where we can say that uh, this will be a well tolerated combination, then it will be certainly worth a try, but not at this point in time. 
right thank you very much last... yeah yeah go ahead bhavesh <laughs> uh, i actually wanted to ask whether anybody any sir just taking uh, uh, just my questions out no go ahead uh, so go ahead like go ahead. Uh, any any uh, sir uh, anybody or any situation where uh, we have uh, anybody has used apatinib after uh, in second line after first line pro uh, first line progression on jeftinib allotinib or osimertinib whether does it work in second line after first line progression okay think, so yeah go ahead seventy no I, i was just saying i think all of us have and uh, you know there's no clear cut to this i have had successes but i've also had failures where the patient you know before we didn't have uh, earlier we didn't have so many molecules so yes i've uh, gone to a fatinib after a lotinib or i've gone to a fatinib after osimertinib when the patient doesn't want to switch um and i have uh, certain patients in control right now yes, with I that switch but it's not recommended i also agree and earlier for want of drug i mean that was the sequence that is available there were several patients who were put on and i would say that there were some acceptable pfs on those patients so but that was in a slightly different era i would say thank you thank you perfect so everybody thank you very much uh, tilak has also said outstanding discussion uh, like a mozart symphony wow fantastic <laughs> shridhar can we take one more question Shridhar, yeah, Shridhar, go ahead. Good evening, sir. I'm Dr. Shashi there. Uh, wonder sorry. Wonderful discussion, sir. Actually, I enjoyed it. Thank Just you. one question, like Dr. Meet is there or no? I'm not sure, but anybody can take it. Just evidence for uh, pulsatile erlotinib in leptomeningeal disease. Dr. Santil or uh, anybody can answer this. Sir, Dr. Uh, Amit Rotan had uh, addressed this, but Santil, please go ahead. So there is data, Sashi, there that you can use at the doses, uh, you know, eight to ten tablets once in a week. Uh, as I was going through, I just went through the, uh, you know, the uh, the abstract. But I'm not aware of uh, any maintenance dose that is used in that kind of a situation. Yes, it is toxic. There's a lot of uh, diarrhea and skin rash that you have to face. But if you don't have the option of using osimertinib, you have exhausted radiation and all the general possibilities that are there for such patients. Then that's one of the options that you should uh, exercise uh, in a patient who's got good performance later, especially. Thank you, Doctor Santil. Any personal experience using pulsatile erlotinib in that situation? For... No, I don't have any personal experience. Uh, okay. Okay. I think you can, Sachidar. You can talk to Amit Rotan. He said that he had experience uh, in his patients, and one of them was doing exceedingly well, alive and well for several years. Fine, sir. Fine. Thank you, sir. Thank you. thank you thank you very much all the faculty please now i think we have kept you away from dinner for quite some time and uh, as uh, rajesh mentioned uh, if there is a need for this to be done again we will pick your brains and request for your time also thank you very much i can see santil seventy raja i'm sure others are here but i can't see them thanks very much thank you sir bye bye take thank care you.